It's a book that I began, I didn't even know I was stepping onto a, a spiritual path when I began to read it. I read Louise Hay, I read Wayne Dyer, then I found Deepak Chopra, and I began to read their books because they resonated with me. They made logical and intuitive sense. And I'm a scientist, I'm a social scientist, as well as a minister, and that logical sense is important to me. That scientific sense is important to me. And so he brings that together in a lot of ways. So what Deepak Chopra talks about over and over and over is that when we learn to understand spiritual laws and put it into application, so it's two part, understand it and put it into application, then we begin to get into harmony with nature. When we come into harmony with nature, success begins to unfold organically. But it takes those two pieces. And when we're doing that, we're actually getting in alignment with spiritual law. So often, I don't know about you, but so often I try to get spiritual law to get in alignment with me. <laughs> so far, 60 years hasn't worked. But as I've learned to get into alignment with spiritual law, things begin to unfold in a whole different way. It's amazing to me. Actually, it often feels magical, and it often feels like a miracle. What is success to you? That's going to be individual, because we are unique, individualized expressions of the divine. But what does it mean to you? Just take a moment and think. Success means to me blank. And just think about what it means to you. It might mean to you a relationship that works where you just feel absolutely delighted to be in that relationship in every moment. It could be a job that you love to go to and you get up in the morning and you're looking forward to going to work and you can't believe that the day is over when the day is done. Sometimes you stay later just because you're having a really good time. It might look like a certain amount of money. When I get X amount of money in my bank account, then that will be success. Carol Look is a woman who's done a lot with emotional freedom technique, EFT. She was working with a man, and she had been working with him for quite a bit of time on abundance. And one day she asked the question, so how much money do you have in your bank account? And he said, $12 million. <laughs> and she said, why are you still working with me on abundance? He said, I don't have enough. So even with folks with $12 million in their bank account can feel like they do not have enough. There's a number that we put to something. You know, if you're driving around college this way, coming from Monkey Junction, there's a, I think it's Powerball sign. And every week it has a different number. X amount of money is what's available. So I'll say to Mindy in the car quite often, we could win that, you know. And she'll say to me, you need to buy a ticket. <laughs> so two years of driving that road, I have yet to buy a ticket, but I could win that. I could win that. It's in the field of potentiality, but I have to take the action to do it. So one of the things that Deepak Chopra calls the ultimate in success is this. I want to read it to you so I get you uh, understanding of his words. The unfolding of the divinity within us the perception of divinity wherever we go and in whatever we perceive. So it's both the, the divinity that we recognize, that we live from, that's already within us. We were born that way centuries, you know, galactic timelines ago when we first came into being, if you believe that way. And then perceiving divinity everywhere around us and in all things. I find that a challenge, to be honest with you. Sometimes I have a difficult time perceiving divinity in certain things. Sometimes I have a difficult time perceiving divinity in other people, but usually that's because I'm having a difficult time perceiving my own divinity. And here's what happens. When we're feeling really great, and we're on top of the world. It's very easy when I'm feeling secure. It's like somebody can say something to me, and I'm okay with it. I don't know what they mean by it, but it doesn't matter. I'm not looking 
for somebody to tell me there's something wrong with me. Because I'm feeling great, I'm feeling in control, I'm happy, I'm living a joyful life. But it's also easy to step over here where I'm feeling insecure. I'm feeling not good enough or there's something wrong with me. And somebody could say something, it could actually be the very same, same thing that was said over here, and I take offense at it. Because I'm not feeling so good, so my perception of myself will have something to do with how I read what's coming back at me. So it's a great opportunity for me to step back over here, to step back into my knowing of my divinity, to kind of pull it on, you know, like a shirt and a pair of jeans and get back into it so that I'm living from that place. And so that sometimes it takes that outer recognition for me to begin to live from that inner recognition. The other thing Deepak Chopra says is that the physical universe is nothing other than the self. And we're talking about the big self. This is our spiritual self. This is our divine self. Curving back within itself to experience itself as spirit, mind, and physical matter. So spiritual law is what he's talking about. Deepak Chopra calls law being able to make the unmanifest manifest. I would say to go from infinite to finite, to move from substance through creation into having an object that I can say, yes, this is it, or a feeling that I can say, yes, this is it. It might be a physical thing or it might be a joyful thing. It might be a feeling of love where my heart opens up, but it's being able to Hold a thought in my mind for long enough that it manifests. And sometimes that's hard, particularly when right now the research shows that most people can stay present for about four seconds. And then we sort of loop out. And then we come back home to ourselves and get present again. And then we sort of phase on out and come back home to ourselves to get present again. But four seconds. And part of what meditation does, part of what understanding spiritual law does, it, it, help, it helps us to stay present for much longer periods of time. Now the first law that Deepak Chopra talks about is the law of pure potentiality. The only thing that is limiting us is our own thoughts and beliefs. So the thing that's limiting me is I must not believe enough that I could win that Powerball to go and buy the ticket. Well, I can't imagine that. Throughout the Hurricane Mindy and I would say something to each other like, I can't imagine. And we say, what, baby? We got to be able to imagine it because everything begins in thought. I want to be able to imagine it. So I was messing around with the, the garbage truck coming. We, our, our recycle bin and our garbage bin were full. And I was saying, it's going to come, it's going to come. And people were like, no, nah, it's not going to come. Yes, it is. I'm going to imagine that truck picking up that garbage. And you know what? That very day, the truck came and picked up that garbage. But we had, on faith, put that bin out there. And it was empty when we got home that evening. I was very happy to dance up the driveway <laughs> with no garbage in the garbage bin. It felt like a miracle to me. <laughs> it truly did. So the, Deepak Chopra says there are three things that move us into non-potentiality or pure potentiality. Silence is one of them, and this is a different thing than how we often talk about silence in unity. In unity, we, we talk about going into the silence, which is a lack of awareness of time or space or even sensation. It's pure beingness. Well, this is a step in that. And what Deepak Chopra is calling us to do is spend two hours every single day of our lives. Feels like a lot to me, you guys. But two hours every single day of our lives. No TV, no radio, no books, no music. Just really being present with ourselves. And what he says is going to happen is our monkey mind is going to start going like crazy. And we're going to have all these thoughts and all these thoughts and all these thoughts and they're going to intensify until we are willing to stay committed to that practice long enough that our mind calms itself down. And then he suggests that you go to three hours and four hours and eventually do some long times of one week or two weeks in a silent meditation. 
So when I was in ministerial school, I was invited into, as part of my grade, 24 hours of silence. I was living in Connecticut at the time, so I booked a room at a place called the Guest House in Connecticut, because I knew, living at home, that I would have the hard time being in silence with Mindy, because there's so many things to tell her. And I'd be wanting to talk to her. And I can just imagine I might last five or 10 minutes in the silence because I would just blurt out something. So I wore a button and said, I'm in the silence. And it was really nice because the guest house took care of everything. My meals were included. Everything was just taken care of. And I left, it was getting ready to snow. So I left a little bit early. So I ended up getting home about an hour before that silence was up. So I walk in the door. And at that time we had four cats. And here they come to greet me, and I didn't even think, hey, it's so good to see you guys. And I said, oops, I'm not supposed to be talking to you. But it was back in those familiar surroundings, so it was so easy to fall back in those familiar patterns. And there went my 24 hours of silence. So I had to write that on the paper that I wrote, oops, this is what I did. But when we get in familiar surroundings, sometimes we just drop back into old habits. And so being in silence, beginning to do things with meditation, help us to start to slowly shift those patterns. So the first one is that silence. The second one is meditation. What Deepak Chopra is talking about is to go into the space between the thought. He calls it the gap between the thoughts. And spend as much time as we can in the gap. Here's how I look at it visually. I think about a series of buses coming along. But I'm not going to get on any of those buses. I'm going to slide between the bus, and I'm going to be in the gap between the bus and come out on the other side and be in meditation. And that's how I think about it. But to be honest with you, I'm not there but for small pieces of time. And so there's some other things that we can do to practice meditation. One of them is mantra. Here's a mantra that says, its meaning is I am absolute existence. It's pronounced Om Bharam Namah. Say that with me. Om Bharam Namah. Say it again. Om Bharam Namah. That's kind of a rhythm to it. I am absolute existence. So say that with me. I am absolute existence. The beautiful thing about a mantra is if your mind runs fast like mine, rumination I call it, if your mind runs fast like mine, and it's just tripping along in all kinds of different thoughts, a mantra can help you to focus it. It's done quite often in transcendental meditation. Usually the mantra is given by your guru. But we can do this without needing a guru, but if you want one, that's cool too. But Om Nabab Baram, how do you say it Om Baram Namah. We can simply say it, we can say it aloud, or we can say it silently to ourselves. Mindfulness in this meditation, which you hear a lot about of these days, mindfulness meditation means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But in this instance, I'm talking about focusing on awareness of where I'm at in this moment. What's going on with me in this moment? There's a Harvard professor that when she was a grad student, she started practicing mindfulness meditation. And she did it because of the frustration and the stress that she was experiencing as a graduate student. And what she found is that as soon as she started practicing mindfulness meditation, she had a period of time with it. She had less stress in her life. She had more clarity in her life. She felt like she could think better in her life. And so as she graduated and started doing research, she chose to do the research on mindfulness meditation. Her name is Gail DeBorg. So she's working on the mindfulness meditation. She's setting up clinical trials with it with folks who have depression to start with. There's 600, 6 million, wait, excuse me, there are 16.1 million people who have depression in the United States. And what she wanted to do was find a way to assist people to have less depression. And so she taught people how to do mindfulness meditation. So she took people across two months or eight weeks, had them do meditation for a short period of time every day, and then she measured what was going on in their brains with something called a functional MRI. 
What the functional MRI does is it measures the activity in the brain. But she did something a little bit different. Instead of measuring that activity when people were in the process of meditation, she would have them watch emotionally laden content material and then from that place, after having meditated prior to that, have them watch that material and then while they're watching that material, she started measuring through the, M the functional MRI and here's what she found. The amygdala is what's lit up here on the left. See where it's very yellow? That means it's highly activated. And after eight weeks of meditation, what she found was, first of all, the time in meditation assisted people in staying calmer, but watching the emotional uh, laden content and measuring, after eight weeks you see more reds and yellow over here on the right. So the amygdala is less triggered. So we're me people who are meditating are mediating their emotional states much better. It's working. It worked for her, and now she had some clinical research that shows it works for other people. And what happens when the amygdala is fear and the fight or flight instinct, survival instinct, is what we see triggered in the amygdala. So it was helping people to feel less fear, no matter what they were seeing in front of them. So the med meditation was working, and she was showing clinical proof of it. I want to share just one more instance of meditation. An uh, Indian researcher, his name was Dharma Kasa, was doing Kirtan Kriyas. And so he was using the, the sound Sa, Ta, Na, and Ma, and pairing them with fingers. The index finger, the middle finger, the ring finger, and the little finger. You go one way, you don't go both ways, but you just go one way. And he was pairing those sounds to a familiar tune. Mary had a little lamb. But he was only doing Mary had a. He was working with 60 to 77 year old people to look at their cognitive functioning. And so let's try that. Sa, ta, na, ma. Let's do it again. Sa, ta, na, ma. And what he found was across eight weeks, same period of time, across eight weeks, 12 minutes a day doing this was all it took to increase the cognitive function of the group that he was studying, to reduce the cognitive impairment, to increase the level of memory was simply doing this. Now we can sit in meetings where we're agitated and do this too, and it helps to calm us down. It's very easy to, to just do that. Actually, you can do it behind your back. Nobody knows you're doing it. But it helps you. That's right. It helps you to, to be able to have a form of meditation that you can do anywhere. And I want to share a story that can illustrate this. There was a young man who's living in the Kentucky Hill Hills with his grandfather. And every morning his grandfather got up and every morning his grandfather would meditate. And he wanted to be like his grandfather. So every morning he would get up and he would meditate right alongside his grandfather. And one day he said to his grandfather, you know, I don't think anything's happening. I don't know why you do this and I don't know why I do this, but I like being with you. And the grandfather was feeding the coal stove, so it was warming up in the, the cabin where they lived. And he put the last piece of coal in the stove and he took a basket and he said to his grandson, hey, would you run down to the river and get me a basket of water? The young man, wanting to please his grandfather, ran down to the river and by the time he got back up to the house, guess what? <laughs> yeah, the water was gone. And the grandfather said, oh, there's no water in that basket. Go get me a basket of water. So the little kid runs down to the river, he grabs, you know, a basket full of water, he runs as fast as he can. And there's still no water when he gets there. And the grandfather says, look, come, I'll go outside with you. And he, the 
go do it again. And the kid runs as fast as he can. He wants to see that he's, his grandfather to see that he's trying to please him. And he gets the basket of water and he runs back up there. And you and I know there's no water in that basket. And he said, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why you're asking me to do this. And the grandfather said, look at the basket. Does it look any different? And the little boy held up the basket and the basket was much cleaner. It didn't even look like the same basket covered with coal dust. Spending time in meditation is very much like that water. We're cleansing ourselves. We're clearing ourselves. We're changing our very thought patterns if we choose to change them by spending that time in meditation. And we have scientific proof that it changes our brain. And when we have a healthy brain, it makes a difference. I want to take the sa ta na ma a little bit different and show you. This is a spect graph. Before and after meditation, eight weeks. A spec scan was taken. What spec scans show, Daniel Amen does a lot of this work. What spec scans show is across a period of time the blood flow in the brain. And on this left hand side, where you see these dark spots and some holes, what that means is blood is not flowing in the brain in those locations as well as it's flowing where it's that pretty purple and blue. And when you come back over here to the after, eight weeks. 12 minutes a day of meditation, you see how the, a lot of those holes have filled in? That's the impact of meditation on our brains. It helps us to clear our cognitive process. It helps us to mediate emotional states. It helps us to stand strong in who we are and in our divinity. This is the outcome of living in that pure potentiality. And when we are willing to do that, to live in those spiritual laws, we're open to possibility. I really might win someday, the day I buy a ticket, or someday after that. Expand our consciousness and recognize our power. We no longer have to be at the effect of what somebody else thinks of us. We no longer need to be at the effect of our own emotional states, which are kind of like the waves they float around. Have you ever started the day feeling really good and then something happens and you're not feeling so good anymore? If we just took 12 minutes to go into meditation, we could come back to that state of feeling good. And as you get practiced, it doesn't even take those 12 minutes. We can live in the expectancy of seeing the divine in everything. It would be like Christmas every morning. You know that expectancy, that wonder, that fascination that you have as a kid? That is available to us in every single moment. It's living that expectancy of the divine and seeing it show up and getting delighted by all of the different ways in which it shows up. If you're interested in this, I'm going to invite you to affirm with me, I am the presence of God in action in my life. We're standing in our power. So if you're interested, let's say this together. I am the presence of God in action in my life. We're going to sing our way into meditation. <coughs> Linda Thunberg is going to come up and lead us into meditation. <coughs> 